Warning, this video contains anime-only spoilers. Before watching this video, check out the first two parts I covered in this three-part video series of 86. The first season of 86 is told in three distinct parts. Part 1 was a setup. It established the world building, character motivations, and created emotional investment for the audience. Part 2 created tension and drama and set up the stage for the inevitable meeting between Shin and Lena. And the last two episodes are what I call Part 3. It delivered one of the most satisfying and touching climax and conclusion to any anime I've witnessed in recent memory. Episode 23 contains a ton of parallelism. The contrast between the first and final episode flips the narrative on Shin and Lena. Shin began the season in a cold, dark setting. Meanwhile, Lena lived in a world of luxury and privilege. In the final episode, their roles are reversed. Shin is living in comfort, surrounded by the warmth of his family, while Lena revisits her tattered and empty room. The colors set the tone perfectly. Red and warm for Shin, while blue and ice cold for Lena. The constant contrast between both sides continues as both characters visit the graveyard. Shin's encounter with Nina was an interesting one. When the two first met, Nina was shy and wasn't able to express gratitude despite her brother's best efforts to teach her. In episode 23, Nina has finally overcome her shyness and expresses her appreciation by thanking Shin for leaving a memento of her brother. Another cool detail I missed was in the picture itself. Federica's fingers were covering the lenses while taking the picture, and it shows up in the photograph. Back in the Republic, we see the devastation caused by the Legion invasion. Only three of Lena's squad members remain. The former Republic is now under the GI Federacy's control, and the war crimes committed against the 86 are exposed to the public. Does anyone remember these three despicable clowns? Yup, that's right. The fates of the three drunken officers are also revealed in the final episode. Their discontent with equality is the ultimate form of irony, for they were the oppressors who upheld the abuse of the 86, and now they're the same people complaining about not being treated fairly. There is a rift in the sentiment within the Alban population. Some of its citizens are disgruntled with the new order established, while the others are hopeful it will bring a brighter future. The original slogan is altered from Welcome to the Republic of San Magnolia to The Republic of San Magnolia will come true. Which means its citizens are optimistic that someday their nation will become a true republic. Not just for people with silver hair, but for everyone. Back in the office, we revealed that Lena has been promoted four ranks, jumping from captain to colonel due to her critical role in defending the republic. Another stark contrast can be found in the colonel's room. The last time we saw his office, it was fully decorated with nationalistic pride. But now, none of it can be found. The snake is clearly trying to disassociate himself with the previous regime. His shameless efforts to fake his new persona knows no bounds. The pictures on his desk are clearly staged, as you can see how little enthusiasm is displayed by the 86, who were probably forced to take a picture with him. In the next picture, the wife closed her eyes to try to conceal her Alba identity, but it was all for nothing because the kid gave it away by opening his eyes anyway. Colonel Lena receives a report of her new squad, with a bunch of names redacted. In her mind, it's probably a little bit sus, but they were just trying to surprise her later on. Let's take a closer look to what room she is in, and I think we can come to another conclusion. I remember seeing this pointy chair back when Lena was reporting to Jerome back in part 1. When the camera pans back to the same empty chair, I think this implies that Jerome Costal is either missing or killed in action. During Lena's visit to the war memorial, when she looks up the names on the wall, she is unable to locate the names of the five missing Spearhead members. Devastated, she whispers, I won't forget, exactly five times. One iteration for each of the Spearhead five, for they hold a special place in her heavy heart. Just like Shin before her, she leaves the box of the Fallen 86 at the memorial. She has fulfilled the promise delegated by the Undertaker. 
to remember and to honor them when they're gone. Shin and Lena's paths slowly converge as the episode draws to an end. There was another form of symbolism with the imagery of white birds during Shin's visit to the memorial. As Shin's monologue occurs, one lonesome bird flies out of the dark abyss and rejoins the other birds in flight. This is symbolic of Shin conquering his inner demons and is ready to rejoin his friends in their journey called life. Back in Episode 9, when the Spearhead Five made their march out of Republic territory, five birds took flight. With Lena joining their group, there are now a total of six birds in the sky. But before we go into the last segment, let's take a look at these final moments from Lena's perspective. The symbolism here is off the charts. Notice how the Alba are facing towards the audience while the 86 are facing forward, symbolizing cowardice from the Alba and their avoidance of the war while the 86 are headstrong and moving forward. And finally, the Spearhead 5 are at the forefront of it all for obvious reasons. These last few seconds move by quickly, but they deliver a strong message. In my previous video, I talked about how there were exactly 86 days between the date of announcement to the date of the season finale. As suspicious as it sounds, it's actually canon. The Spearhead 5 made it home on December 24th, just in time for Christmas Eve. They later reunite with their commanding officer on March 20th the following year. 86 days later. Coincidence? Fido's montage sequence was one of my favorite moments in part 1. I'm really glad they brought it back for the finale. Fido's upgrades were briefly mentioned in episode 14, but in episode 23, we can see his hardware has been upgraded from grainy standard definition to HD 1080p. The storytelling here is unique because the characters are using Fido as an outlet to interact with the audience directly. I want to mention Fido's point of view is in a classic 4x3 aspect ratio. Director Ishii's clever use of this framing creates a feeling of nostalgia as well as putting more emphasis on the characters, and thus we feel much more connected to our beloved protagonists. Each character gets their own unique moment to shine. Raiden has a callback to when he first saw Lena's appearance back in Episode 9. When Lena shared visuals with him through the raid device, he caught a glimpse of her reflection through her monitor. Anju is hopeful the Black Kitten is the same one they left at their old barracks. In their farewell letter, Anju and Karina both asked Lena to take care of the kitten after they're gone. In another memory, we find out that Dio was the first one to find the kitten. It should be obvious why she is so attached to the black cat. Oh no. It's Anju's pain corner again, isn't it? Theo shows off some impressive shipping fan arts. His sketches are now in color, thanks to the colored pencils given to him as a gift by Ernst. In Fido's first montage, there was a moment in time that Theo thought he was a goner. It was Theo's symbolic moment of giving up on life and his hobby by tossing his sketchbook into the flames. Contrast that dark moment with the present. Theo is now full of hope and is genuinely smiling for the very first time. Kurina is still in denial, but we'll talk about her later. On a side note, the direction from right to left has significant meaning and has reoccurred throughout the season. In Japanese literature, you read from right to left, a natural sign of progression and the very definition of moving forward. Throughout the show, we see many instances of movement from right to left. The theme of moving forward comes full circle in the next scene. As Lena makes her way towards Shin, we get a half second of their encounter from the previous episode. From Fido's point of view, we can see a beautiful transition of Lena walking in the same direction towards Shin, from right to left. This is made possible because in Fido's memory, he was upside down in the previous episode. This is why I'm such a big fan of the director and his excellent use of attention to detail. As Fido witnesses Shin and Lena's meeting, a piece of metal flashes, symbolic of the tears that will be brought to the audiences around the globe because in this moment, we are all Fido. As the rest of the squad struggles to keep their composure, Theo stands out from the rest. He remains poised, having the utmost respect for Lena. 
a complete 180 from part 1. Theo began as Lena's biggest critic, but now he's become her second biggest fan. The reunion is done beautifully, but when you do a side-by-side -side comparison with episode 11, it becomes even more impactful. As Raiden calls her, Baaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
have so many questions. We last saw Lena and Annette finally reconcile their friendship. I wonder what will happen when Annette finally reunites with Shin. Will Andrew finally get more screen time as second best girl? Will she ever find happiness? Or will they keep on making her suffer? Whatever happened to Uncle Jerome, who's not really her uncle since they have different last names? Hello, thank you for watching this video all the way through. I know 86% of you click off the video and don't listen to me ramble, but the remaining 14% of you, you the real one, alright? Did Shin and Lena really take 86 days to meet? Did this video really took 86 days after the show aired to come out? The answer is yes. It wasn't my intention to delay this part 3 for 86 days. It's just that I felt burnt out after completing part 2 and needed a break. And then I suffered from writer's block, so it really took me a long time to finish this. Now, you might be thinking, what happened to episode 22? Well, as I was writing, I went on a really long tangent and I felt episode 22, the things I wrote, really didn't belong in part 3, but rather it should become a video of its own. And I really wanted to focus part 3 on the actual ending because it was just so impactful. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, share this video because it means a lot to me. And I hope you guys come back for more because I'll definitely be covering more 86 videos in the future. Until then, I'll see you next time.